I think we'll move on to the next uh, speaker. Uh, Dr. Larry Reeves is an assistant professor of, uh, with the University of Florida at the Florida Medical Entomology Lab, which is right next to the Audubon House. Um, he researches, uh, we've talked a little bit about mosquito, mosquito diversity, ecology, and biology, and the ecology of mosquito control with extensive knowledge of both insects and plants. His research, he uses photography to both prove insight into research questions, ecological interactions between mosquitoes and other organisms, and to aid in communicating research results, teaching mosquito identification and mosquito-related messages into a, a, a large audiences. Uh, he has worked with a lot of uh, various places in southern Arizona, the Philippines, Borneo, Peruvian, Amazon, and elsewhere. And he will enlighten us with the biodiversity crisis and the importance of insects. Um, why does PIS give away free trees? We give away free oak trees because we learned that about 400 different insect species are found on southern like oaks in our county and are critical for insects need, uh, birds need insects before they will reproduce. They don't have enough insects around, they'll say, well, we're not gonna nest, we're not gonna produce any young. Um, he is uh, one of the, he's so very knowledgeable in identifying plants and insects and that's how we got to know him because he does such a wonderful job at the Audubon House helping us out there. His title is going to be The Biodiversity Crisis and the Importance of Insects. So we've had fish, we've had uh, birds, and, and now we're going to have some things on insects. Thank you. Over here. Yeah. Richard, th Richard, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate it. And thank you all for having me and uh, for your attention. Um, so my name is, oh, uh, this is advanced? Yeah. Okay. So again, uh, my name is Lawrence Reeves. Uh, so with this presentation, um, also bear with me a little bit too, because I just put this together this past week and I haven't uh, given this presentation in front of people yet. So uh, just let me know, or hopefully it comes off okay. Usually I'm talking exclusively about mosquitoes. Um, so with this presentation, I'm going to try to dump a lot of information on everybody. Um, and in a lot of places, I don't, there won't be enough time to get too far into um, uh, some of the important details. So I've put these QR codes uh, alongside titles of resources that I think are relevant and uh, uh, should provide information that I'm not covering in the detail that I'd like. So uh, with these, you can just uh, open the camera on your phone and uh, point it at them, and it should take you to that particular resource. Okay, uh, so uh, to get everyone in the mood uh, to talk about insects, we're gonna start here in uh, the Sonoran Desert. Uh, so this is Saguaro National Park uh, in July, just towards the beginning of the summer monsoon season that's going to deliver about half of this region's rainfall. So if we were to go out into the mountains here uh, at dusk, we could set up a couple of bed sheets like this and turn on a bright light. Uh, so if, if we did this, if we did this, we would be inundated with a flood of nocturnal flying insects. Uh, so this bed sheet and bright light set up here uh, is a kind of standard technique entomologists use for sampling nocturnal insects. So out in southern Arizona, these light traps can be quite, uh, quite the spectacle, drawing in a tremendous uh, abundance and diversity of insects. So for me, I've always, been, I've always been interested in insects, but seeing this in person uh, out in the desert and the variety of uh, uh, forms among insects that came into these sheets, uh, this was one of the things that really sparked my interest in entomology, leading me to dedicate my life to studying, uh, in, uh, studying these wonderful little creatures. So uh, humanity has a kind of complicated relationship with bugs. And I don't think that it's really recognized just how amazing, um, uh, how amazing and complex insects and other arthropods are. So take, for example, these uh, Chrysina jewel, jewel beetles. Um, so these fly around, fly and amble around the uh, uh, mountain rainforests that are their homes uh, down in Central and South America. They, they look a lot like these just kind of drops of molten silver or gold. 
Or think about uh, the tarantula hawks that stalk the southwestern deserts, sniffing out tarantulas. So when they find one, a battle is going to ensue with a female wasp trying to sting the tarantula. So if she's successful, um, uh, she'll, she'll sting that tarantula and drag it back to, to her burrow, paralyzed by her venom. Uh, where she'll lay a single egg uh, and then seal down in that burrow, the baby wasp is going to consume that paralyzed tarantula as it grows. So these wasps, they, they fly around the desert uh, with impunity from any would-be predators. Uh, not only does their venom paralyze, uh, paralyze when administered to a tarantula, uh, but a sting from one of these wasps causes a vertebrate about 10 minutes of just blinding pain. So Justin Schmidt, uh, who created a pain index for hymenopteran stings, ranked the sting of, the, of this wasp at a pain level four, which was the, the highest of the scale. So pretty amazing, right? So there are even insects that have figured out agriculture. So for millions of years, uh, leafcutter ants have been harvesting vegetation. So these ants, they, they, they don't eat these leaves. Uh, they carry these leaf fragments down into special garden chambers in their nests, uh, where they use the leaf fragments to feed and cultivate a fungus that is their real food. So uh, like insects, the complexity among spiders and other terrestrial arthropods, I think, is very rarely acknowledged. So in this example, this is a bolus spider. Uh, so one of the ways that male and female moths find each other in the darkness of night is through the use of smells. So for many moth species, the female is gonna emit a smell kind of like a perfume that's going to attract the male. Uh, so this spider, uh, this spider mimics those, uh, uh, mimics the smells of a lady moth and waits there for a, uh, a love-seeking male moth to fly in. And as soon as it senses um, uh, a, male, a male moth flying in, it throws this glob of glue at the moth, essentially lassoing it and then dragging it back uh, where it doesn't find a female moth. So the insect and arthropod world is full of stuff like this, uh, and much of it we're just entirely unaware of. So for example, for a long time we've marveled at the tales of luna moths and other moths, but only over the past few years have we learned that these tales serve a very important function. So the purpose of tales in luna moths and other moths like this is to serve as a decoy to deflect the attacks of bats away from the body of the moth. Uh, there's also mosquitoes that exhibit a bit of parental care, uh, brooding and babysitting their eggs to keep them from splashing out of the water holding containers in which they're laid. We have caterpillars that are just exquisite uh, mimics of venomous snakes. There's fireflies that congregate in, in specific trees and flash in synchrony. Uh, and there's cicadas that spend 17 years underground keeping track of the years uh, by counting the winter-spring transitions that their host plants undergo, uh, then emerging in the surface in near synchrony on that 17th year. <laughs> um, so insects are amazing, and after learning about their diversity and light trapping down in the Sonoran Desert, uh, I decided I would go to graduate school and study butterflies and moths in the Philippines. So at that time, I was very interested in Lepidoptera, uh, the butterflies and moths, uh, but of all the insects out there, the ones that really captured my heart were the mosquitoes. Uh, <laughs> So now today, and for the past 10 years, uh, I've, I've worked to understand mosquito diversity. So I've also realized that not everyone shares my enthusiasm for mosquitoes, <laughs> and I guess, I, I, I guess that's understandable. Uh, in general, uh, I think that the only time anyone sees or hears about mosquitoes is when they're causing problems, and they certainly do cause problems. Uh, often, uh, when we see them, we might see something like this, a nondescript uh, tiny insect biting us and making us itch. Or maybe we see them more like this, um, but either way, uh, we notice them only when they're causing problems, uh, when they're biting us or when there's a news story about mosquito vector disease. So I think that there, or to me, there's a, so much more to mosquitoes than just the itchy welts and disease that a few of the bad apple species are responsible for. So in, in my lab at UF, uh, we're always trying to get a clearer view of mosquitoes. A clearer view not only of what they look like, but also a clearer view of what mosquitoes are doing in the landscape during the majority of the time, uh, the majority of their time when they're not uh, uh, bothering people. So here, I'm just gonna talk about mosquitoes for a moment, in part because I think that they're, they're cool, it, because I think that they're the coolest, uh, but also because uh, I think that our complex relationship with mosquitoes reflects our complex relationship with insects more broadly. 
So uh, globally, we've got about 3,600 different mosquito species with about 90 that occur here in Florida. One important thing about these is that each species is distinct. So from our human perspective, uh, some are bad, some are good, and the vast majority are go aren't going to be causing us any real sub substantive problems. So to illustrate the nuance uh, between mosquito species, consider the, mosquitoes, the mosquito Aedes albopictus. So if you've ever spent time outdoors in our area, uh, you've certainly already met this, this mosquito. Uh, so this is a common nuisance mosquito throughout Florida. It's loosely associated with human modified areas and it really loves to bite people. It's also a potential vector for several mosquito vector viruses, including the dengue, chikungunya, and Zika viruses. So contrast that mosquito with Toxorynchites rudalis. So here you can really clearly see some of the morphological variation that exists between mosquito species. So Toxorynchites rudalis um, uh, is a beneficial mosquito. The larvae of these, uh, um, uh, the larvae of these live in the same kinds of habitats as uh, the larvae of Aedes albopictus, uh, and they're they're voracious predators of other mosquito larvae, including those of these Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus mosquitoes. So at the same time, the adult mosquitoes, uh, the adult toxorynchitis mosquitoes, they never feed from blood. They feed entirely from, plant, from nectar from flowers and other plant-derived sugars. Okay, so while toxorynchitis mosquitoes never blood feed, the females of most mosquito species do, uh, and they need that blood in order to produce uh, viable eggs. But at the same time, humans aren't the only animals that are being bitten by mosquitoes. And mosquitoes aren't only vectors of pathogens that impact humans, uh, they also vector pathogens that impact wildlife. So in natural ecosystems around the world, mosquitoes are interacting with all kinds of different organisms. Uh, so they feed on warm-blooded animals like mammals and birds, and they feed from cold-blooded animals. So here in Florida, a very important host for several mosquito species are these brown anoles and other lizard species. So many mosquitoes are specialists of wildlife hosts that have no interest whatsoever in biting humans. One really fun example of this, I think, is the mosquito Uranotinia loei, which takes blood exclusively from uh, frogs, which the females find by flying around in the darkness of night, listening for the songs of calling male frogs. So mosquitoes also feed from a lot of kind of surprising animals, like well-armored crocodilians and turtles, marine mammals are bitten, uh, some fish like mudskippers and eels that spend some time towards the surface, and even worms. Uh, and so these host associations uh, between mosquitoes and uh, uh, the, the animals that they bite is one of the topics that my lab at UF uh, focuses on. So this blood feeding, um, uh, this is the quirk of their biology uh, uh, that need to take blood from other animals in order to produce viable eggs uh, that make mosquitoes so familiar to the majority of humans who have, uh, so familiar to the majority of humans who have existed on the planet. Uh, so it's also what makes them so dangerous as the vectors of pathogens. Uh, and it's because of this that mosquitoes are able to transmit pathogens from, uh, uh, pathogens between their hosts. Uh, because mosquitoes serve as vectors of pathogens, um, uh, a small minority of mosquito species that are out there have had a very tremendous impact on, uh, on our species, perhaps more than any other group of animals. So at the same time though, uh, mosquitoes are, are involved in ecological services like pollination. So you can go out at night with a flashlight and, and inspect the flowers uh, like the flowers on maybe your mango tree uh, and you might see mosquitoes uh, nectaring and potentially serving as pollinators for uh, uh, for for, the, for those, those, those flowers. While the females of some mosquito species need to blood feed in order to um, uh, produce eggs, the real food source of all mosquitoes, both males and females, is going to be sugar. So to get that sugar, they visit uh, the flowers of a wide range of plants. Uh, some of those are economically important, like uh, mangoes or lychees, and others are ecologically important, like the, like the flowers of common milkweed, maybe the most important plant species to uh, monarch butterflies in the United States. 
So the importance of mosquitoes as pollinators has hardly been looked at, uh, but we do know that they visit flowers for food, sometimes in tremendous numbers, uh, and we know that they can pick up pollen from the flowers that they visit, uh, but in order to be effective as pollinators, uh, they need to deliver that pollen to the stigma of another flower of the same species. So at this point, we just don't know, we don't have a great idea how important mosquitoes are uh, as providers of pollination services uh, for plants and native ecosystems. So we similarly know very little about the importance of mosquitoes in food webs, but adult and larval mosquitoes are certainly important food sources for a variety of small predators. So consider though uh, that the larvae of uh, mosquitoes are aquatic, and one of the most important predators of these larvae are, go are going to be small fish. So mosquitoes help to support, support these small fish, which then go on to become food for larger and larger fish. So I expect that uh, mosquitoes are, are kind of similar to sea turtles in the sense that few of the eggs that are, that are laid by the females are going to survive to the adult stage. So with, with many of those that are laid, uh, the larvae or um, uh, pupae will be consumed by uh, some sort of predator. So think about that and also recall that mosquitoes need to feed from flowers. Uh, now think about the clouds of mosquitoes that you might see uh, in the northern states during the summer or down in Everglades National Park or the Florida Keys or even out here around the lagoon. So think about uh, how many of, the, of these mosquitoes might have been eaten by other organisms along the way to get to this point and think about the potential pollinating force that such a tremendous abundance of mosquitoes might be capable of. So uh, this is why I think that our relationship with mosquitoes reflects the relationships of, of uh, our species to insects kind of more broadly. Uh, so mosquitoes and insects have tremendous impacts on our species, and in science and society, we tend to focus on uh, most of these negative impacts. So for mosquitoes, we primarily have studied how they impact human, how they impact humans, and how we might mitigate some of those impacts. But we still know very little about the importance of mosquitoes within the uh, within nature. So uh, shifting gears a little bit, um, when we talk about biodiversity, uh, what we're talking about is the totality of life on Earth. All of the organisms and all of the species that are uh, both described and undescribed. So we don't, we don't know exactly how many species are currently here on the planet, uh, but recent estimates place the number of plant and animal species uh, uh, that exist today at about 8.7 million. So of these, we, of these, we've only described about 1.2 million species. So here, when I say described, uh, this means that a species has been formally described uh, and cataloged by science, but by uh, science and given a name. So of those that are described, about 60,000 are vertebrates, while the vast majority, more than a million species, uh, are invertebrates, mostly insects. So these numbers don't reflect that, that there are more people studying um, uh, insects and other invertebrates uh, than are studying other groups. Uh, so insects compared to vertebrates are comparatively understudied. So it reflects that the diversity of insects is just, is just incredible. So it's estimated that more than half of the species um, uh, alive today are insects. So notice in this figure, uh, the estimated proportion of insect species, this blue on the right, uh, especially compared to uh, chordates, essentially the vertebrates, that tiny sliver uh, on the top left in gray. So, um, Again, uh, insects are by far the most diverse group of animals. Uh, with, within the insects, the group that has the most diversity are the beetles. So beetles alone account for um, uh, more than 400,000 described species. Um, with an estimate, and we estimate that the true richness of beetles is, um, is maybe on the order of 1.5 million species. So this incredible diversity of insects that we see today makes, uh, makes good sense considering the small size of insects and, the corresponding ability, uh, and their corresponding ability to divide an ecosystem uh, into, sm into very small niches. Um, together, or, uh, in addition to that, mosquitoes are also ancient and have been present uh, on, the, on Earth for many of the big milestones of the terrestrial ecosystems. So insects have really shaped the world as we know it. So if you consider flowers, so flowers don't exist for uh, the human, uh, a human brain to marvel at. They exist in the majority of cases uh, for insects, uh, and they've evolved these very gaudy colors um, uh, most often because of insects. 
Uh, so the function of these bright colors is to advertise to pollinators, uh, again, most often an insect species. So each flower of an insect pollinated plant, which is, which is the vast majority of flowering plants, uh, evolved characteristics that best fit their pollinators. So for example, this is the flower of Mirabilis longiflora, uh, a species of four o'clock native to the Sonoran Desert. So these flowers are pollinated by hawk moths, and likely for that reason, uh, they open only in the evening and at night uh, when the hawk moths are active and they're white, and they're this pale white, uh, likely so that they'll be most, most visible to um, uh, these moths. So the anthers and the stigmas, uh, uh, the anthers and the stigma are strategically located up in a position where visiting hawk moths are most likely to place their faces. So when a, when a moth sees this advertisement and visits uh, for its nectar reward, uh, its face is going to pick up pollen uh, 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 and hopefully transfer it between uh, the anthers and the stigma. So each insect pollinated flower evolved alongside its pollinators. So here, just one more example of this. Uh, so, so here's just one more example of this. So this is a flower of a species of Amorphophallus that's pollinated by carrion feeding uh, insects. Uh, by, looking at, by looking and smelling like rotting meat, uh, this plant tricks flies and beetles into visiting the flower, uh, and these beetles and flies serve as its uh, pollinators. So while I'm on the topic of pollination, another point that I want to raise about pollinators uh, is that there are, there, are a few, there are a few pollinator species that seem to get most of the credit for pollination services, in particular uh, honeybees and butterflies. Uh, so while they are, while, while these while these species are, while these species and groups are important uh, to pollination, pollinators are also very diverse, and many insects uh, and it, many insects might visit a flower and contribute to its pollination. So honeybees especially get a lot of the credit, and I think that it's less widely appreciated that first, uh, honeybees are non-native here in the United States, uh, brought over to the Americas for honey. And secondly, uh, the diversity of native bees is extremely high. So in the United States alone, we've got about 4,000 uh, bee species, and all are important visitors of flowers. So similarly, nocturnal pollinators, I think, are very underappreciated. Uh, so I, I encourage everyone to go out at night with a flashlight and inspect the pollinator, the pollinator night shift that might be visiting the flowers that you grow. Uh, so you might see a diversity of moths, like hawk moths, uh, mosquitoes, beetles, and other pollinators that you otherwise would never know uh, were visiting your flowers. So pollination is an example of an ecosystem service that's provided by native insects uh, that benefit our species. So uh, we and also the terrestrial uh, ecosystems that we live in depend on and need these ecological services. So in addition to pollination, uh, a few of the key ecological services that we rely on uh, include pest control, so native insects that consume uh, our pest organisms, waste removal, especially the burying of poo by dung beetles, uh, and support of our uh, economically important wildlife and fisheries throughout th through the food web. So these four ecosystem services alone have an estimated value of about $92 billion just in the United States. So the next time you go to a grocery store, or even better if you go to Robert is here down in, the, down in Homestead outside of the Everglades, uh, try looking up the pollinators of the fruit that you see for sale. So much of the fruit that's available to us uh, is all thanks to insect pollinators, and not only honeybees and butterflies. So we should also appreciate uh, insects any time that we drink milk or eat a cheeseburger. So uh, for humans, uh, key, ecological service, uh, key ecological services provided by uh, insects include the, uh, removal of, the removal of waste, especially by scarab dung beetles. So fortunately for us, uh, these beetles really love, uh, love poo, and so as soon as uh, poo hits the ground, dung beetles, whose noses are precisely tuned to the smell of poo, uh, they try to be the first ones to arrive um, uh, at the poo so that they can hoard, it, uh, hoard as much as possible down underground. Uh, so by doing this, uh, they help us tremendously. Uh, here in the United States, they decompose almost uh, two, or they help to decompose rather, almost two trillion pounds of poo that are produced by our cows each year. In doing so, uh, they also ret are returning nutrients to the soil, increasing the quality of uh, the forage for the cattle, recycling nitrogen, and reducing habitat for uh, uh, fly pests. So while we benefit tremendously from the activities of some insects, our most important uh, competitors for, food, for the food that we're growing uh, are also insects. 
So each year, insect pests and, and our efforts to control them cost our economy billions of dollars. Uh, but this is only a fraction of what we would spend for pest control without the activity of beneficial native uh, predators and parasitoids, uh, essentially the natural enemies of our pest species. Uh, so these help to control, uh, so the, these natural enemies help us to control these pests and limit the damage that they cause. So the value of pest control services provided by native insects is estimated to be about $6.5 billion each year. So similarly, uh, insects are a critical food source for many fish, birds, and small mammal species uh, in the natural ecosystems in which we fish, hunt, and bird watch. And without insects interacting with other species in these food webs to the extent that they do, uh, these activities likely wouldn't be possible. So in these ecosystems, insects are at the base of the food web, and these small animals, like mosquito fish, uh, eat them and again go on to become food for larger and larger organisms. So on top of all that, on top of all these ecosystem services that are provided by insects for the benefit of our species, insects are also important to us because they help, to, they help us to create uh, certain products, resources, and technologies. A classic example of this is silk. Uh, so silk comes from the cocoons of the domestic silk moth. So here, one of these cocoons, each one of these cocoons is uh, constructed from a single strand of silk. So after uh, processing, these cocoons can be unraveled, and the resulting strands can then be woven into the into the textiles that we refer that we refer to as silk. Uh, so I'm not going to get into it too much here, uh, but another uh, benefit of insects, uh, including the pupae of these silk moths, is that around the world, uh, mostly outside of the United States, insects are also used as uh, important food sources. Recently, though, here in the United States, there have been increasing, increasing calls to move towards insects as an environmentally friendly source of protein. So we also use insects in biotechnology and medicine. So uh, in genetic and bio re uh, biomedical research, many advances have been made using um, uh, the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster, as a model organism. We also have compounds from the venoms of insects and other arthropods in a variety that we use in a variety of applications uh, to create medicine, uh, including vaccine develop development. So for example, the Novavax uh, COVID vaccine uh, was developed based in part uh, using uh, uh, cells from moths. So that covers the importance of uh, insects to humans. So in the interest of time, I'm, not, I'm just going to kind of breeze over this, but insects also have uh, tremendous importance within their uh, natural ecosystems. Uh, so, it's one, so, so it's the insects uh, and other invertebrates, not so much the mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians, that are really the movers and shakers um, uh, in most terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, insects are fantastically diverse and tremendously abundant. They're herbivores, uh, they're decomposers and predators, uh, and, a great many, um, and a great many other species depend on these, uh, on these animals for food, uh, like these bats, uh, or for pollination. So I've talked about it a little bit in this talk, but healthy ecosystems also need uh, healthy and diverse communities of uh, insects and other invertebrates. So one last point that I want to make before moving on here uh, is that within this fantastic diversity of insects, each species that's out there is distinct and it has its own story. So even among these tiny, these uh, tiny, maybe one or two millimeters uh, sized insects uh, collected from vegetation in the Soren Desert, each one of these has its own weird, wonderful, and maybe surprising story. Uh, so each one is going to interact with distinct, in distinct ways with plants and other animals in their ecosystems, uh, and each has its own requirements that they need uh, in order to survive and persist in, uh, in their environments. So it's important to note also that within this diversity, we've hardly scratched the surface of understanding insects, and for, the vast, and for the vast majority of insect species, we just have no clue about what those stories are, uh, or we have no idea what makes them distinct from others. Uh, so like I mentioned previously, uh, we've described now about, uh, about a million insect species. Describing them doesn't necessarily mean that we know, that we really know anything about them. Uh, it just means that we've given that species a name and described its physical appearance. So take this, take, this beetle, take this beetle from southern Arizona. Uh, this is a species that was described in 1958 uh, from a specimen that was collected uh, at a light in southern Arizona. Uh, other, than, other than a description of what this beetle looks like, um, uh, we don't know anything about what this beetle does in nature. Uh, so uh, this is also the way that it is for the vast majority of insect species. Again, for most of these species, we just don't have any clue what they're doing uh, in the environment. 
by chance, in 2021, uh, my lab came across this beetle uh, while we were out hunting uh, mosquitoes out in the desert. And we learned that this is a beetle that's a predator of mosquito larvae. So these beetles appear to be associated with water-holding tree holes. Uh, and in these tree holes, they're able to crawl down into the water. So this is a terrestrial beetle that crawls underwater, cloaked in this bubble of air, where they kind of fish around trying to capture uh, mosquito larvae, which they'll then drag back up to the surface. And so bringing these back to the lab, we found that they eat a similar number of mosquito larvae every day uh, to uh, Toxorynchites mosquito larvae. So switching gears again, um, well, um, one other, one other resource that I'll mention here is uh, in the 1980s, E.O. Wilson came out with a paper titled The Little Things That Run the World. Um, I think that this is a really good introduction to both the importance of insects uh, and the importance of their conservation. So uh, if you want a pretty short read that's relatively accessible to um, uh, wide audiences, this is a good place to start. And we'll touch on some of the things that I talked about and, and much more. So now switching gears again, uh, you might have heard that our environment is in a bit of trouble. Uh, so around the world and in not so many decades, we've transformed the surface of the Earth, largely eliminating the vast uh, swaths of wilderness that once made up Earth's terrestrial surfaces. So in their place, we've installed these uh, matrices of developed areas uh, that primarily serve our interests. We've changed the land to support our agriculture and livestock, and we've changed it to build roads, housing, and box tour chains. Uh, meanwhile, we've pumped uh, carbon dioxide out into the atmosphere to the extent that we're changing the uh, global climate. So while we're aware of the issues uh, and implications of this, fixing these problems hasn't been happening with any of the speed, purpose, or seriousness that's required. So if we zoom into Florida and we go back in time several generations, this is what the state of Florida's land cover would have looked like. So the entirety of the state was covered by these natural land covers uh, and plant communities. So notice here in particular these extensive tracts of uh, scrub and sand hill uh, here in yellow, and also the mesic pinelands in darker green. So over just a few generations, uh, we've kind of chipped away at these tracts of natural land. So this map here on the right uh, shows Florida's land cover in 2017. So notice especially how the scrub and sand hill, uh, how the scrub and sand hill habitats, again in yellow, uh, throughout Florida and the mesic pinelands in dark green uh, on the peninsula uh, ha have, de have declined in size. So when I was putting these slides together, uh, I thought these, th th this map is a little, a little bit busy. There's a lot of colors and a lot of categories, and it's kind of difficult to get a good feeling of what's going on here. So I spoke with uh, Lindsay Campbell and her student, Amy Bauer, uh, colleagues of mine at the Florida Medical Entomology Lab, uh, and we put together this, this map based on the same data set, only an updated version that came out in, in December of last year. So here, uh, you can see that there are only two real categories of land cover, modified and unmodified. So we collapsed all of the uh, modified land covers into one category and all of the unmodified categories into another. And so this is, this is uh, what we see. Um, so again, uh, everything that's here in red is modified. Uh, this could represent houses or condos. Uh, it could be agriculture. It could be mining operations uh, or cattle grazing. Really, anything that's modified that's modified to benefit human interests and is and no longer represents the native plant community. So meanwhile, on this map, the green, uh, this kind of pale green, is uh, representing the unmodified areas. So this is, a pretty, this is a pretty dramatic change that has real implications for the state's ecosystems and biodiversity. Uh, so I think that um, the most worrisome thing about this is that these land cover changes are ongoing. So this isn't an endpoint for Florida's land cover chains change. Uh, I, I heard just a few weeks ago uh, that uh, in the news that Florida was reported to be the state with the highest population growth in the country uh, for the first time in some decades. So this doesn't bode well for the future. Uh, and even more troubling is that this is the sort of thing that's going on around the world to varying extents at various locations, uh, while at the same time our uh, changing climate further complicates uh, this situation. Uh, most concerning, I think, is the situation in the tropics, uh, whose tropical forests support the majority of, uh, of, life, uh, of life and species on the planet while, storing tremendous, while at the same time storing tremendous amounts of carbon. 
So as it turns out, there are consequences for planting monocultures, knocking down forests and natural habitats, and for pumping carbon, uh, carbon dioxide out into the atmosphere. So a few years ago, entomologists around the world began recognizing changes in the communities of the insects that they study. So I'll note here that uh, there are actually lots and lots of consequences, but here we're mostly going to, we're almost entirely going to talk about those that are relevant to insects. So evidence started trickling, trickling out about uh, declines in populations of nocturnal insects in Costa Rica, uh, butterflies in Europe, insect biomass in Germany, uh, beetles across the temperate forests, um, uh, and other taxa in other locations. Uh, plus, there have also been a flood of anecdotes uh, about fewer but butterflies visiting butterfly gardens, fewer fireflies, uh, uh, fewer insects hitting windshields of Amazon Prime delivery trucks uh, or coming to porch lights. Uh, maybe, maybe people here have also noticed uh, changes in the insect communities of the areas that they frequent. So these declines are also at the same time inherently difficult to study and to quantitatively demonstrate uh, because decades ago we hadn't anticipated being in the situation that we're in. Uh, so, we don't, so in many cases we don't have historic baseline data uh, with which to make sound comparisons. So, but at the same time, uh, in, and, and in some cases, especially in Europe where butterfly and other insect nerds have a very long history, we do have historic data that we can compare uh, with our current data. So together, um, uh, the data that we do have is troubling. And over the past few years, headlines like these have shown up in the popular media. Uh, so they, come, they might come off as a little bit alarmist, but the data and anecdotes that are available uh, do suggest that there are substantial declines in insect diversity and abundance uh, taking place. And these are something to be taken very seriously, given the importance of insects uh, to humans and the importance of insects uh, to life on the planet. So one, uh, one particular uh, uh, story that came out just last month that I really recommend reading is this one that came out in Reuters. Uh, so it does a really good job of summarizing the situation with insects. And, and, it, and the most important thing of this is that it gives these excellent and very thoughtful um, uh, figures and infographics uh, that describe kind of the situation that is, that is happening. So um, some of, if you want to take a picture of this slide too, this, this provides a few of the uh, reviews that have summarized all of the, uh, that have summarized uh, at least at the times when these came out, all of the available data that was relevant to um, uh, quantifying declines, quantifying and recognizing declines in uh, insect diversity or abundance uh, on various uh, insect taxa in various parts of the world. OK, so if we think again about the extent of land cover change here in Florida uh, and about these kinds of changes and about how these kinds of changes are taking place around the world, um, uh, in all of the red areas here on the map, uh, the land cover has been modified uh, from what was once a native plant community to spaces that are essentially unusable to the vast majority of the insects that previously inhabited those spaces. Remember again that each species is going to be distinct and has its own story. So there's certain uh, requirements that need to be met in order for a species to survive and persist. Uh, consider, uh, consider these moths. So these moths just don't materialize when, a light, uh, when an outdoor light is turned on. They come from caterpillars that eat specific plants. Uh, they come in from the landscape where they're members of, of ecosystems that interact with uh, other members of these same ecosystems. So when those native plant communities are changed, uh, those species, th they might hang on as best they can, but if the landscape doesn't meet the needs of those species, uh, if the host plants of a moth caterpillar decline, for example, that species will also decrease in its abundance or disappear entirely from an area uh, as that landscape uh, or, the, or its climate can no longer meet its needs. Uh, and this is what we see in various locations around the world. So decreases in diversity and decreases in abundance, especially among uh, species that were once common. So, but this, at the same time, uh, the story isn't all bad for all species. Uh, because, each, again, because each species is distinct and each responds to environmental change in their own distinct ways, uh, we have some species that are increasing in abundance. So these changes, uh, that have these biotic changes in these developed habitats have been termed uh, biotic homogenization. 
Uh, so in this, uh, in biotic homogenization, a few winners, a few winner species uh, replace many losers. So the winners here are the species whose requirements are met by the modified landscape. So these species are often non-native or invasive. They're often generalists, and they're able to thrive in these modified landscapes. Some examples of these uh, include uh, brown anoles, uh, Aedes albopictus and Aedes uh, aegypti mosquitoes, uh, or pigeons. So in these modified land, <laughs> In these modified landscapes, uh, these species uh, replace those that were previous that previ previously occupied those areas. So these are the essential winners uh, again that replace the losers, the species that no longer can survive in uh, a, a given habitat. So. Again, uh, not all species are responding negatively to human-induced environmental changes. So consider again that mosquito, uh, Aedes albopictus. So the range of this mosquito is limited by cold temperatures to the north. But with climate change, we anticipate that this is a species uh, which is, th th this is a species, uh, again, which is already a winner, uh, that's going to expand its distribution further northward. So in this map, the red indicates its current range, while the green, purple, and orange um, uh, represent its expected range given, um, uh, model, uh, given models of, climate change, of various climate change scenarios in the future. Okay, so what are the primary drivers of insect declines? So insects are affected by the same factors that impact uh, other animal and plant life on the planet. Uh, the declines that we talk about uh, with insects are just one of the facets of the broader biodiversity crisis. Uh, so these declines in insects uh, have, have, have been described as death by a thousand cuts, uh, meaning that uh, we expect that there are various factors that are contributing in different ways across different species and taxa. So, um, uh, for any given species, the particular factors that are most important will vary uh, from one species to another. So most broadly, the, um, the factors that are impacting insects can kind of be, be grouped into those that are related to uh, climate change and those that are related to habitat loss, habitat degra degradation, and land cover change. So this graphic here, produced by David Wagner and his wife, I think does a really good job of summarizing this. And again, uh, you can scan this QR code to go directly to this paper that kind of outlines and highlights um, uh, these, these drivers mentioned here. So climate change related factors include increased fire risk, uh, like the fires that we've seen in the American West, in Borneo or in the Amazon, uh, increased storm intensity, sea level rise, uh, droughts and changes in precipit precipitation regimes, uh, and changes in temperature uh, driving shifts in distribution of species like, um, uh, like Aedes albopictus. The other, major driver, the other major driving factors are those that are related to habitat loss and degradation, uh, and also changing land cover. So in addition to the uh, removal or restructuring of native plant communities, human modified areas are often polluted, not only with the chemical pollution that might come to mind, but also with light and sound. Uh, uh, they're often full of non-native and invasive species, and they might be chronically impacted by pesticides, like in agricultural areas or potentially through mosquito control uh, efforts. So again, uh, the factors that are important to a given species are gonna vary from one species to another. One really good example of this is, the, is Florida's Shao Swallowtail. So this is a butterfly that's uh, Florida endemic, meaning that it's only found here in the state, and it's also federally listed as endangered. So this butterfly uh, was found in Florida's extreme southern peninsula and the Upper Keys, where it lived in uh, this very unique uh, habitat, the tropical hardwood hammocks. So unfortunately for the Shao Swallowtail, developers are also really big fans of, of these tropical hardwood hammocks. Um, uh, so in this map, the area outlined in green represents the uh, historic range of the Shao Swallowtail, while that area, um, the area in red, um, essentially, uh, the northernmost keys represent its current, its current distribution. So its last strongholds in these areas are, um, uh, and, and primarily thanks to the efforts of uh, the Florida Museum, uh, are uh, Elliott Key in Biscayne National Park and uh, Crocodile Lake National Wildlife Refuge in um, uh, Key Largo. Uh, so this species, this species, the range of the species uh, contracted initially as a response to loss of habitats. Uh, but 
this contraction in range also brings about other risks or issues for the species. So historically, if a, if a strong hurricane came through and knocked out much uh, and knocked out a population, that population could be essentially reseeded by uh, migrants from uh, uh, remaining populations that were less impacted. Uh, today, the, today the, uh, for the shell swallowtail, for the shell swallowtail, its eggs are in far fewer baskets, so it could take just one direct hit from a strong storm to uh, entirely knock out the species. So other factors that impact uh, insect populations include invasive species, uh, like, like the tachinid flies that were brought in to control um, uh, uh, pest moths uh, uh, some decades ago from Europe. So these flies were released as biological controls uh, for, for these pests. Uh, they performed poorly against their targets, but they really liked to parasitize and kill uh, the larvae of uh, silk moths, and they've been cited as a potential driver for the declines in uh, Cecropia and silk moth, uh, Cecropia and Luna moths that have been uh, anecdotally observed in, uh, in the Northeast. So pollution is another factor. Uh, in addition to chemical pollution of soil or waterways, many insect species rely on sound to communicate or to find mates. So this map uh, shows um, estimated sound pollution levels uh, throughout the United States, uh, mostly, from engines, uh, mostly from engines or roads. So areas with high levels of sound, uh, especially around roads, uh, can influence animal behavior. It can they can, this can drown out uh, uh, the songs of singing, singing insects. It can affect the movement of insects and other animals. And it can, it, and it can also impact uh, predator-prey interactions. So light pollution is uh, similarly important to insects. So the vast majority of nocturnal insects are attracted to lights at night. Uh, and artificial lights serve as a very powerful sensory trap for many night flying insects. So these, these lights uh, often indirectly kill insects that are attracted to them, either through uh, the uh, insect flying around that light source uh, until it exhausts itself or through predation. Uh, so for example, a moth might arrive at one of these lights, uh, just fly in circles until it uses up all of its energy, or if it lands, uh, it's going to stay there, given that there's a light, uh, given that uh, uh, it sees light, uh, until the morning when, it could be picked, when it's easily picked off by a predator, or until that light turns back on the next night. Um, so that's kind of a quick summary of insect declines. Uh, there's a lot more going on here, and I really uh, encourage everyone to check out some of those resources that, uh, uh, that I mentioned and learn more about the situation that faces insects. Uh, the last thing I'll cover is uh, how we at an individual level, level uh, can help uh, insect populations. So at a broad level, I think that the two best things that we can do um, uh, is to create insect-friendly ha habitats uh, and to um, uh, help to increase awareness and appreciation of insects within our community. So we've talked about this uh, in other talks too, but as humans, and for some reason, we really have this tendency to modify our immediate surroundings into some savanna-like landscape with low green, green grass, maybe interspersed with some trees or shrubs, uh, like you see in our yards, our parks, and our cemeteries. So these habitats that we create, while they might be pleasing to our brains, uh, they're essentially monocultures, and they're really not conducive to insects or the ecological services that, that they and other species provide. So on top of that, they also require these constant inputs of energy, time, and money uh, to, to, keep, to keep them uh, maintained. Uh, so here, this is a satellite image of my neighborhood. Um, you can see here that this is a landscape that's probably not conducive to the original uh, uh, insect community that lived that once lived here. So this is up near Sebastian, alongside some of the areas where you might see scrub jays. We don't see scrub jays here, uh, but within half a mile we have uh, populations of scrub jays. Uh, but here, this landscape, uh, over time, is. For, is, is being further modified. So over the past year, uh, in, and increasingly rapidly, the, all these vacant lots that at least provided some uh, cover for insects and birds and maybe a few native plants uh, have, been, have been knocked out. Uh, so these are especially helpful for insects and other wildlife as kind of stepping stones to move between habitats. As some of you may know, up by Sebastian, there are these nice kind of pockets of scrub and other uh, relatively natural habitats. And so uh, maintaining these last remaining vacant lots uh, 
can help provide uh, these stepping stones that allow insects and other animals to move through these landscapes. So here, one thing that we can really do to help insects uh, is to convert our lawns to, to active nat uh, natural habitats by planting native plants or even just letting them, uh, uh, letting them go through succession uh, towards hopefully something that's more natural, hopefully not invaded entirely by non-native plants. So we should also be very, con again, this is something that we've talked about a lot today, but we should also be very conscientious, conscientious of the plants that we're putting into our landscapes. So native, native, plants, uh, native plants share these long evol evolutionary relationships with native insects. So when we fill our landscapes with non-native ornamental plants, for the most part, our, non -native, uh, our native insects have no use for them at all. Uh, and these plants don't provide food or habitats uh, for diverse communities of native insect species. So by deliberately planting native species over exotics, uh, we can enhance the value um, of, of our spaces for native insect species. So there's also been some evidence that links declines of suburban backyard birds uh, to increases in exotic ornamental plants. So this also makes sense given that the vast majority of songbirds are either insectivorous or they feed insects to their young, uh, and landscapes that are made entirely out of uh, exotic plants don't support diverse communities of native insects. Further, uh, native plants are going to be adapted to the, local, uh, to the local climate and often don't require the same level of maintenance that uh, some of these non-native ornamentals might. So because adjusting our immediate habitats with, uh, uh, or rather beyond uh, adjusting some, uh, Beyond adjusting our immediate habitats with insects and nature in mind, uh, there's a few other things that we should consider uh, if we'd like to create these habitats that are friendly for insects. So one thing that we can do is to limit the, our use of, of uh, unnecessary external lights. So as we talked about, artificial lights are these really powerful sensory traps for many nocturnal insects. Uh, and these lights are believed to be, be among the drivers of declines in some nocturnal species. So for sea turtles, we're very conscient conscientious about turning off or dimming our lights along the beaches, and we can do this for insects too. Uh, we also don't entirely need to eliminate exterior lights. Uh, we have other options, like we can use lights that are motion activated, we can use, uh, we can shield ball, we can uh, shield light bulbs, or we can use bulbs that emit wavelengths of light that are not so attractive uh, to insects. So as much as possible, we should also be limiting the amount of pesticides that, that, we, um, uh, that we use, especially uh, outdoors. Uh, while, while controlling insect pests is often necessary, uh, we really need to carefully consider when we're using uh, pesticides and um, uh, what pesticides we use. Um, we should also consider if alternatives to pesticide use are available. Um, so use of pesticides for cosmetic purposes, for example, uh, preemptively treating a plant to prevent insect feeding uh, is something that should be avoided entirely. Uh, similarly, we should avoid using these barrier treatments for mosquitoes uh, as much as possible. So in, this, in, in the case of barrier treatments, a long-lasting insecticide, usually a pyrethroid, is applied to the vegetation along the perimeter of a, of a yard, and any insects and in, any insects that come in contact with that um, with that barrier treatment are going to be killed. So of course this likely has lots, of, this hasn't been well quantified, but this likely has plenty of non-target impacts and it's thought that this is also contributing to the development of pesticide resistance among the target uh, mosquitoes. Uh, so also, before we, uh, before we resort to chemical treatments like this, we should also be attempting to eliminate uh, any standing water in our, in our yards. Um, uh, two of the most common uh, nuisance mosquito species, uh, Aedes albopictus and Aedes aegypti, here in the Vero Beach area, they're coming from standing water in or around our yards. Each, for those species, each mosquito is not going to fly a, a, a disperse a very far distance, so they're coming from nearby. If you can eliminate those larval habitats, uh, you will likely uh, control your problem without having to resort to um, uh, the use of barrier treatments or other pesticides. 
So people are also uh, rarely willing to protect what they don't know uh, or appreciate. And unfortunately here in our country, for most people, uh, insects are pretty unknown and unappreciated. Uh, and negative perceptions of insects are dominant and widespread. So if you're interested in helping insects, uh, try to do all that you can to portray them as interesting or beneficial. Uh, learn about them uh, and tell others about the things that you find interesting or surprising. So I know for mosquitoes, I'm not gonna be changing too, too many minds, uh, but insects are so much more than mosquitoes or cockroaches, uh, the insects that, mo that people are most likely to uh, notice and, and to interact with. So if you're on social media, consider making posts about insects and other bugs uh, that help other people to see and understand these, uh, these, uh, these species. Uh, similarly, uh, become an, an educator, ambassador, or advocate for insects. Uh, outreach through formal and informal teaching can also be a very powerful means of increasing awareness and appreciation of in insects, especially when, when the audience are children. So the first wild animal that a child is, is going to encounter or interact with is very likely to be an insect in, its, uh, uh, in that child's um, uh, immediate area. Uh, in these cases, positive experiences and reactions to those uh, uh, interactions, I think, are very important in developing an appreciation, for, an appreciation for nature, especially given the limited amount of time kids uh, are spending outdoors today. So, as much as possible, we, we should also be encouraging kids to understand uh, to understand insects and nature and nature more broadly, uh, especially given the state of nature today and the issues that today's children are likely going to face in the coming decades. It's likewise important to connect with adults and to help dispel any negative perceptions of, uh, of insects that they might hold. So um, lastly, I think it's important to get involved in local politics or relevant issues and keep insects in mind uh, when, you're, when you're voting. Uh, many of the issues that are facing insects are linked to the broader issues like uh, of climate change and land use. So in general, we need to be mindful of the impacts that our choices are, make, are having uh, and we should learn as much as we can about how, how our lives contribute to the problems that we face. Uh, by adopting some behaviors like turning off exterior lights and avoiding others, we can contribute directly or indirectly to insect conservation and we should be, and we should be carefully considering uh, how we can help to make a difference. Um, so if you want more information, we recently put out a paper that kind of details these points that I just went through. Uh, um, and you can find, so these are points that, uh, these are things that individuals can do to help insects. So this is a very good resource if you're interested in uh, uh, doing what you can to help, uh, help with insect declines. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Uh, if there's time for questions, I'll be happy to take some now. Uh, but feel free to also reach out to me via email or social media. I think you can take one of the So I don't have a strong opinion about this, uh, but I, what I will say uh, is that in general, mosquito control, uh, the mosquito control professionals that are employed by these um, uh, government agencies, they care about avoiding non-target impacts and doing what they can to balance, to, to very effectively balance mosquito control and the impacts of, uh, or the need for mosquito control with environmental concerns and of course other concerns as well. Uh, I think that uh, just on the fly, um, I think that it is not a bad idea to have elected uh, mosquito control um, uh, boards because then the people in that area have some voice. I know, I know it's difficult when it's very nuanced, when these situations are very nuanced and uh, there's not a lot of understanding among populations of uh, this kind of balance between vector control and environmental concerns, uh, but they do keep those keep those concerns in mind. Uh, I think it's important to, um, or I, I think mosquito control broadly is important, especially in um, relation to kind of some of these private companies. So at least mosquito control. Uh, uh, at least governmental mosquito control agencies are responsive and care about 
um, uh, the opinions and ideas of their community, whereas uh, these private mosquito control companies, uh, uh, they are motivated by getting you to subscribe to their services and getting your money so that they can come spray pyrethroids around your yard uh, every two weeks um, without a need for... That's a, that's a good point. I think we are getting some species of uh, mosquitoes here in Florida, but only about three species uh, or less are even important to come around humans. So there's most of them are out there doing a lot of good things. Yeah, for, for most of the mosquitoes that are out there, you have no idea that they're there because they're, they are uninterested in biting, uh, biting a person. Um, I mean, I know that the ones that do, they give them a really bad name, but they're, they're, they're really cool guys. <laughs> the, the, oh, the, the one last thing I'll say about mosquito control also is that um, uh, I just want to mention that when mosquito, con or when mosquito control is done uh, appropriately, uh, surveillance is a big is a big factor. So these uh, mosquito control governmental agencies, they aren't just spraying um, uh, on a schedule or whenever they feel like. They are putting out traps and monitoring mosquito populations to understand uh, what needs what requires a response. Uh, if they get a lot of phone calls from a uh, population, they will they will go out and treat even if it isn't. Uh, concern for um, uh, uh, even if pathogen transmission isn't a concern, um, uh, but they do take a lot more into consideration than just um, going out and spraying, as opposed to private pest control entities. Right. Thank you. We're going to have a, a quick break. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.